<clears throat> okay. We're about to start the, uh, the next and, uh, and last main session. <clears throat> I'm Jonathan Wiener from, the, uh, from Duke Law School and Nicholas School of the Environment and Earth Sciences. I'm really pleased to see so many people here and uh, it's uh, terrific that we uh, have this event. And before introducing the last session, I just want to um, express all of our gratitude to Chris Mills and all the students who organized this event, invited the speakers, conceived the event, and really pulled it off terrifically. So thank you very much. <laughs> Um, and uh, let me just uh, mention some quick um, agenda adjustments, schedule adjustments. Um, we will have uh, this session starting from 2.45. We will uh, give each speaker the full 20 minutes. And then rather than um, switching it, there's no question and answer period indicated in your schedule after this session, but then it, it indicates that we switch to a panel discussion. Uh, but instead, what we're going to do um, for a reason I'll uh, explain in just a second, is we will have open Q&A as we have had for each of the other sessions following this session. And then at 3.55, uh, uh, no later than, we will need to uh, conclude this session and um, vacate this room because there's another, uh, apparently another event happening in this room uh, after four o'clock. And But we will relocate to the Birdman Lounge, which is at the, on this floor, but at the far end of the building, uh, where the reception will be held at 5 o'clock. But from, say, 4, 4, 10 to 5 o'clock, we will have additional opportunity for uh, comments, discussions in a more relaxed and intimate setting. Um, more comfortable chairs. Um, so, um, so that's the scheduling plan. Um, uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, I certainly would invite any of the speakers from prior sessions to participate, to contribute uh, with reflections on this session or on uh, any of the topics raised during the entire day during this Q&A session that we'll have uh, in the last half hour of this session and again in the four to five uh, conversation. Um, so I'm uh, very pleased to introduce our uh, two speakers, Lois Schiffer and Perry Pendley. I will not give extensive introductions because the time is short. I want to maximize time for them to speak and also because their uh, full bi biographical sketches are in your, um, are in your uh, notebooks. Um, I have to say that um, uh, I feel a lot of uh, empathy with J.B. Rule's plea for some kind of uh, uh, middle ground. And uh, uh, J.B. said the result of that was that he would not serve in either uh, administration. Um, the result for me was serving in both administrations. Um, and so I served as a non-political appointee in both the first Bush and first Clinton administrations and worked very happily on environmental policy in both of those. And one of the privileges of that time was that I got to uh, work, uh, albeit briefly, for uh, Lois Schiffer just before I came here to Duke. And uh, even sat at Lois's desk. Uh, she was very gracious to, to let me. So. Um, <clears throat> I remember your shoes under the desk. So uh, uh, that was at the Justice Department Environment and Natural Resources Division where Lois was the Assistant Attorney General. That's the uh, Assistant Secretary level position in charge of the division, in charge of some 350 attorneys who handle all federal environmental litigation for all the federal agencies. And she has also taught at Georgetown and will teach shortly uh, at Harvard Law School. So I'm delighted to have Lois with us here today. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. I'm very pleased to be here, and particularly to have students not only from the law school, but also from some of the other schools here. I'm going to talk today about the National Environmental Policy Act, how it's doing today, with some emphasis on its application across U.S. borders, because that's an interest that's an issue that's always been of interest to me, and I was glad to have the opportunity to spend a little time on it. Um, the National Environmental Policy Act was passed in 1969 to become effective in 1970. That means it was signed by President Nixon with hope that 
it would really be a, a, a seminal, important, and bipartisan statute. It has, it's a very broad statute with a lot of aspirational goals and a lot of substantive uh, uh, provisions, but it really has come to be known for its environmental impact statement requirement, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. But I always like to remind people that there's actually a lot more in NEPA than just the environmental impact statement requirement. The environmental impact statement requirement has really several uh, goals. The first is to require federal agencies to develop environmental information, including alternatives, or as I say, comparative shopping, when they're undertaking uh, actions that may have a significant effect on the environment. The second to, is to use that information to inform the decision maker and to be sure that the decision maker then uh, takes that information into account. It doesn't have to dictate the decision, but it is part of the record of the decision. And the third is to provide for public participation. Of course, the concomitant of this, like every other administrative agency action, is that there's court review. And I think of court review as being there to keep the system honest. That is to be sure that the agencies are doing what they're supposed to do to implement the law. Um, uh, how has NEPA developed over its history? Uh, in uh, when the year that I turned 50 and NEPA turned 25, I gave a talk about NEPA growing from infancy into middle age. And I will not reprise that talk here, but I will say briefly that when the statute was first passed, many of the agencies couldn't quite believe it. And so we had a series of cases, including a very famous case from the uh, D.C. Circuit called Calvert Cliffs Coordinating Committee, where, the, where Judge Wright said, the statute really means what it says in agencies. You have to really believe it. You have to develop the information. When we say accompany a decision, we don't mean one piece of paper next to each other. We mean you actually have to read the pieces of paper. Um, <laughs> it's quite clear decision and quite interesting. Um, after that, the Council on Environmental Quality, which was established by NEPA when it was passed, that was one of the other things it did, uh, developed first a series of guidelines and then a series of regulations to implement the statute. The regulations really helped to codify in regulations what had been a series of court decisions that really were what uh, helped to develop a quite short statute into something with some meaning. It's, and then each agency adopted uh, their own regulations to implement the Council on Environmental Quality regulations, and the practices and procedures under NEPA became somewhat more regularized. It's helpful to know, although it's a little bit hard to get the numbers exactly, that there are approximately 500 EISs a year and more on the order of 50,000 environmental assessments, or short-form EISs a year that are done by the federal agencies. EPA has to, uh, by law, keep track of the environmental impact statements, but it's quite a bit harder to get a handle on um, the environmental assessments. But this is a lot of gathering of information, taking information into account, and in general, opportunity for the public to have input into agency decision-making processes. And I think the general view is that over time it has had an impact on what the decisions are that um, agencies make. Uh, it's very helpful to understand that uh, there's been enormous emulation of the EIS requirements. Uh, first in states, at least 17 states have their own EIS requirements. Approximately 100 countries, more or less, now have uh, NEPA-like requirements, and the World Bank and other, bank and other <laughs> multinational organizations as well. It's quite slow. Um, uh, do. And so this is something where the United States really has been seen as a leader, but now, and this is particularly important when we get to the international component of NEPA, it's very much the way that things are done across the world. The gist of this bulk of my paper, my talk then, is going to be in two parts. What's going on with NEPA now, and then a look at the international components of it. NEPA, in its getting old or middle age, is facing a serious set of new obstacle courses that can be seen as big boulders. First, the loneliness at the altar. That is, no one's holding its hand, in, or its hand isn't always held in court anymore, and I'll use two specific examples. You've heard a great deal today about the roadless rule, and I will therefore make this part of my talk a little bit shorter than I thought I would. Um, it was promulgated after extensive opportunity for review and participation, as you've heard from Gloria Flora, um, four to 600 public meetings, over a million public comments. It was an EIS that was developed over a year. The roadless rule was promulgated. It was promptly, a uh, suit was promptly filed on it. Uh, nine different lawsuits were brought. 
the new administration perfectly appropriately stayed its application for 60 days, as it did with many regulations and as virtually every administration does when it first comes in, to take a look at what's out there. And I, I think nobody has any problem with the fact that a new administration is going to look for a little while at what happened. That postponed the effective date to sometime in May 2001. The court in Idaho didn't wait for that, and when um, environmental, I, I'm sorry, when the state sought a preliminary injunction against the rule, the court said, I find many problems with the NEPA process and detailed them at great length, but I'm not going to rule right now to give the new administration a chance to do what it wants to do. Um, the new administration then uh, in early May announced that it was going to keep the rule in place, but it was going to um, have a new rulemaking to sort of fill in the exceptions, and some of us thought that might mean that the exceptions would swallow the rule, but it also wasn't really going to defend the regulation in court. And so uh, at that point, the Idaho court did enjoin it really for problems in the environmental impact statement process, so the court said, even though there had been this extremely detailed and elaborate process. The environmental groups appealed to the Ninth Circuit, which in a fairly strong and detailed decision went through just how extensive and detailed the environmental impact statement process had been and affirmed both that process and the regulation over a vigorous dissent uh, and then denied rehearing in banks. So basically where that left NEPA is in what would normally be a place where its hand would be held by the Justice Department and the agency to defend it, it was stood up. It had no one. But that is not the end of the story. As you've heard also today, uh, one of these lawsuits was brought in Wyoming before Judge Brimmer. This, I think, was not an accident that Wyoming was picked. And even after the Ninth Circuit said it was fine, Judge Brimmer issued a 100-page ruling saying there were at least five significant problems with the environmental impact statement process. And he was enjoining the rule nationwide. Now, I was at the Justice Department for quite a long time, and we generally took the view, as did other parts of the Justice Department, that a district court judge could make a decision for that district court judge's district, and everyone would pay attention in that district court judge's district. But for a single district court to enjoin a rule nationwide wasn't so usual, and normally we would go back and ask for it to be narrowed uh, and so that we uh, had an opportunity to test it in other places. That did not happen, and the government did not appeal this ju Wyoming judge's decision. So they're now operating as if this rule was enjoined nationwide, despite the fact that the Ninth Circuit said that the NEPA process was fine. Poor NEPA, all alone by itself. That's one obstacle. Uh, a second uh, example of where it's been left alone at the altar of the court, or somewhat questioned at the altar of the court, is a case called Public Citizen versus the Department of Transportation. Um, this is a case that arises out of agreements in the North American Free Trade Agreement Treaty and relates to Mexican trucks coming into and operating in the United States. Uh, there had been for a while a moratorium on the trucks coming into the United States. That matter was taken to an arbitral tribunal. It's a procedure under the NAFTA, and the uh, tribunal had said there was a problem with the United States' moratorium. President Bush then announced that he had an intention to lift the moratorium once a component of the Department of Transportation issued regulations about certifying the trucks and their operation and so forth. Um, the DOT came out with the regulations, excuse me, President Bush lifted the moratorium and the regulations were then challenged in court, I, I, or they were challenged in court, the moratorium was lifted and the, eventually the Ninth Circuit said there were significant problems with these regulations because there had not been an environmental impact statement that took full account of the cumulative uh, impacts that would be caused and also, by the way, there hadn't been compliance with the Clean Air Act conformity requirements. And so the regulations were enjoined. Um, that's sort of a normal set of procedures for NEPA. The problem is what came next. Right now, the government has petitioned for certiorari on this decision, saying not just that there was a problem with something in the court ruling, but that it was a much broader problem. That is, this had something to do with the treaty, it had something to do with foreign policy, and that really extinguishes the NEPA requirement. Um, because it so, is so directly related to foreign policy, never mind that really the decision-making agency here was the Department of Transportation, it wasn't the President, and the President's decision just followed on to the, um, the agency decision. 
So, so far, uh, no action has been taken on that cert petition. The other side is uh, in the process of filing a reply, and we'll see. But it's a second example of where in court, when the fact of NEPA you think would be being upheld, that was not the case. The second big threat is hunger from new regulations. Um, the Forest Service has issued, in the context of saying that it's to fight fire, uh, a set of regulations saying that a number uh, of, um, uh, of actions are categorically excluded. That is, they don't need either environmental impact statements or environmental assess assessments except in extraordinary circumstances. Now, there's a provision in the CEQ regulations for categorical exclusions. That's perfectly normal uh, for agencies to do. And the standard is they can be issued if the particular action individual, if the category of actions either individually or cumulatively will not have a significant effect on the environment. What are the set of actions that these um, uh, categorical exclusions for the Forest Service have now issued? Well, if it is a controlled burn of 4,500 acres, that's covered, or if it's another kind of thinning project, i.e. timber cutting, that's 1,000 acres, that's not covered. And when you think of that cumulatively, 1,000 acres and 1,000 acres and so forth, it's hard to think that that isn't going to cumulatively have a significant effect on the environment. And yet, those decision makers aren't going to have to develop or take into account environmental information. That regulation's now been challenged, but it may also, as you've heard, uh, or a version of it get codified when the forest, uh, when the new so-called healthy forest bill goes through. Again, it's a little hard to understand how having information is going to hurt people, but that seems to be the case. The third uh, thing that NEPA is facing now is the assault from legislation. Again, the timber sales is a piece of it, but there also is has been a proposal not yet enacted for streamlining in the highway bill. The highway bill is enormous amounts of projects all across the country under the name of streamlining, some components of which are perfectly sensible. It doesn't need to take 10 years to have an EIS process. Um, but if streamlining means you don't have to look at alternatives, that is just comparative shopping, uh, and there's no opportunity for review, that's a real problem. And there's also a way in which uh, there's an effort in the energy bill to not uh, to get around uh, environmental impact statement information for energy development on Indian lands. So NEPA is also a facing assault from legislation. And finally, as with many other processes and agencies, it's facing the serious diet of insufficient funding. Um, the Natural Resources Council of America, a completely neutral group, had did a report in 2002 on NEPA where they surveyed 12 agencies to talk to them about what their experience would have been with NEPA over the years. It's a very informative report, but basically what all of the agencies said is as we're, our budgets are being reduced and reduced and our responsibilities are being increased and increased, it's really impossible. If you keep NEPA on this uh, diet, pretty soon they're going to have health problems in middle age. So that's the state of middle age NEPA today. It's being forced to run an obstacle course without nutrition or other means to do so well. In short, it's having a rough go of it in this administration. Now I want to turn my attention to five more minutes in five minutes, uh, a, which I'll try to do, a case study of uh, a, a condition of this advancing age, the current state of applying NEPA to U.S. federal agency decisions that have impacts outside of the United States. This has been an issue that's been around since the earliest days of NEPA, and my recollection, which may or may not be right, is that Jonathan actually worked on it when he was in the Justice Department. No, sort of. Um, the f federal agencies haven't quite known what to do with the statute when the U.S. action either is going to, uh, it, it, the U.S. Deci the decision is plainly made in the United States, but if it's to fund a project in another country or it's to fund a project in this or give permit to a, a project in the United States but that might cause an impact in Canada or Mexico or some other place, it hasn't been perfectly clear what's supposed to happen in terms of do you look at this under the National Environmental Policy Act. And the, is sometimes, I think as a misnomer, this issue is called extraterritorial application of NEPA. Um, in the early days of NEPA, the government seems to have taken the position that it would examine projects, uh, uh, whether the impacts were inside of the U.S. or outside of the United States, and based on that, courts kind of just implicitly assumed it. Um, in the Trans-Alaska Pipeline case, for example, 
where the impacts were going to, and the pipeline indeed might well go through Canada. The agency certainly thought there should do a study and the court assumed it. Um, in a case that was related to the Darien Gap Highway, which was a highway, they, highway that was to go from Chile all the way up to Alaska, there was a portion of it in Panama. Uh, an environmental group sued to say there needed to be an EIS, and in defending that suit, the United States specifically said it never questioned the applicability of NEPA to the construction of the highway in Panama. Panama, it was a little concerned about how it would look at some very localized impacts. So the, and there are other cases where the court assumed it as well. Indeed, in 1976, the Council on Environmental Quality came out with a memorandum talking about EIS requirement to impacts abroad, and it basically said they should be analyzed and disclosed as part of the information developing process. But war broke out in the late 1970s, I think particularly as the State Department was not keen about having to meet this requirement. And it essentially, it seemed to say this is an interference with foreign policy and really what you're doing is applying U.S. laws outside of the United States. There's a body of law that's developed about the extraterritorial application of U.S. laws and I think the easiest way to see it is in the context of a, what was a Supreme Court case where a United States company was operating in the Middle East. Somebody sued to say that um, our discrimination laws apply to employees there, and the, eventually the Supreme Court said, no, that's really extraterritorial application of our enforcement laws, and unless a certain set of requirements is met, like Congress saying it really means it, that's not going to per pertain. If you think about NEPA, that's not really what's happening. The decisions are getting made here. The information uh, can be taken into account by U.S. decision makers. We're not talking about regulating somebody outside the United States. We may be talking about putting conditions on the way the United States spends its money abroad or, or issues its permits abroad, but that's quite different from regulating abroad, which is really what that extraterritorial uh, doctrine was designed to do. Nevertheless, in the Carter administration, an executive order issued which basically said if it's an action outside of the United States, then agencies should, should do, not are required to do, but should do something which is sort of a version of an environmental review, but in particular, you can't take it to court. Um, that executive order um, uh, essentially pertained for a while. It followed a series of uh, cases that had been brought where uh, agencies did environmental reviews and then said to the court, D you don't have to reach the question, and so courts kind of ducked the question for a while. And then um, the, the next big case got filed, and the next big case on NEPA abroad, and, and I think that this executive order really proceeds from the idea that uh, it's a misidea. That is, what we're really usually looking at in um, the EIS process is where's the decision getting made? And it somehow talks about where are the effects of the decision, not where is the decision, and that's kind of where it went off course. All right, there then came to be a, a DC circuit case that looked at um, export licenses by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission when it was going to uh, permit a U.S. company to export a nuclear power plant and nuclear material to the Philippines, where P.S. the plant was going to be built on an earthquake fault. And, um, which gives you great comfort. And um, the, what the D.C. Circuit, um, uh, in a very uh, strange decision, because there were only two judges who sat on it, and they each, for different reasons, came to the result um, that NEPA didn't apply. But one of the judges said it's the extraterritorial application of U.S. laws, and there's a foreign policy problem. The other judge said, under a sort of another NEPA doctrine, there's not enough time to do the EIS here under this particular statute. And so, I don't think it would be extraterritorial application of NEPA, said Judge Robinson, but because of this other, you know, it conflicts on the timing problem, you don't have to do an EIS. Um, th then 10, more, 10 or 11 years went by when the issue sort of didn't come up, and uh, in a case in, the, in 1993, the D.C. Circuit, my time is up, but I'm going to talk for two more minutes, the D.C. Circuit said, um, well, let's look at what happens when the National Science Foundation is going to uh, uh, issue permits for incineration of food waste in Antarctica. 
And in that case, what the D.C. Circuit said is, we agree there's a presumption against extraterritorial application of U.S. laws, but we don't think this is extraterritorial application here. These are decisions by defin in the U.S. By definition, an extraterritorial application of a statute involves the regulation of conduct beyond the U.S. borders. Even where the significant effects of the regulated conduct are felt outside the U.S. borders, the statute itself does not present a problem of extraterritoriality so long as the conduct which Congress seeks to regulate occurs largely within the United States. Um, and then the court went on to say, and besides this is Antarctica, which is not in the jurisdiction of any country, it's a sort of a sovereignless place. And the case is often quoted to say in sovereignless places, the, the rules on extraterritoriality don't apply, but that is the case really said quite a bit more than that. During the Clinton administration, we had very few cases on this. I will pretty much skip it. Um, CEQ did issue some guidance saying you certainly have to look at transboundary effects when the GLOP goes out, so when it goes from the U.S. across borders. That has to be taken a look at. Um, and it also issued an executive order saying that in the context of trade agreements, there should be an environmental review, not an environmental impact statement, not reviewable by a court, but an environmental review. Then along came the Bush administration. And in several cases, it really has tried to cut back even on the transboundary look. Um, two of them relate to actions in the oceans. One was sonar testing and the other uh, uh, by the Navy, and the other was when the National Science Foundation uh, planned to undertake acoustical research in an environmentally sensitive area off the Gulf of California. In both of those, the government said, it's the EEZ, either of the U.S. or Mexico, that's a part of the ocean, and um, so we don't have to do an EIS. In both cases, the court said, are you kidding? No, the, uh, you have to do NEPA. Um, and finally, we reached the case with which I'm most familiar, province of Manitoba versus Norton, which, where I filed an amicus brief on behalf of Canada, the government of Canada, and in that case, um, in North Dakota, the Department of the Interior is trying to take water from a river basin in North Dakota and move it to another river basin in North Dakota where it will thence flow into Canada. Um, and they did an environmental assessment, not an EIS. The province of Manitoba sued. The U.S. government filed a brief saying the defendants do not concede that NEPA's EIS requirement would ever apply to extraterritorial ter territorial impacts of the U.S. action, i.e., they didn't have to look at what happened in Canada, never mind that the water didn't actually know where the border was. So in this area as well, um, the old girl ain't what she used to be, NEPA's still having problems. And in a final coda, I will say that my view of what should happen on um, this issue of, of NEPA uh, when the action or impacts are outside the United States is the analysis that it's not extraterritorial makes the most sense. Um, and to be sure, other countries now are used to looking at environmental information, so we will have an easier time of getting it. But if we run into problems, that can be taken into account in terms of what you look at. Um, and finally, courts, when really there's foreign policy at issue, that is that when uh, issuing an injunction will be a problem, have shown themselves in a number of cases to be able to take that into account. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Lois. Um, next, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Perry Pendley. And um, as you know from the biographical sketch, he's the President and Chief Legal Officer of the Mountain States Legal Foundation, uh, has worked uh, uh, in the Senate, in the House of Representatives, uh, and in the executive branch where, during the Reagan administration, he was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Energy and Minerals at uh, Department of Interior. Um, and he's uh, also the author of uh, two books with attention-getting titles, It Takes a Hero, The Grassroots Battle Against Environmental Oppression, and War on the West, Government Tyranny on America's Great Frontier. Um, and I thought, uh, in, in reading uh, Mr. Penley's paper, a very, very interesting contrast with John Leshy's comment this morning uh, that in Leshy's view, the Bush administration has made happy talk that is pro-environmental happy talk, but not backed that up uh, uh, in uh, actual decisions. And uh, I think one gets the sense from Mr. Penley's paper that the Bush administration, at least in, its, in the campaign, made happy talk about property rights and devolution, but has not backed that up and uh, so it's quite a contrasting view of the actual um, policies and decisions that the Bush administration has undertaken. So thank you very much, uh, Perry Penley. We look forward to your talk. Thank you.
Professor Schroeder began this morning talking about Ralph Nader's view uh, that there is no difference between the parties on defense and uh, uh, the economy. Uh, as a former Marine and as the father of a Marine uh, who's uh, been assigned to Camp Lejeune here in North Carolina, I differ on, on that and think that, that there is a huge difference uh, on the matter of defense. And I uh, refer you to Richard Lowry's new book, uh, Legacy, uh, wherein he quotes uh, various uh, Clinton administration officials on, uh, on defense policy. And as a Westerner, I also disagree because I think there is a vast difference uh, between the economic policies of the Bush administration and the Clinton administration, particularly as they apply to the West. Uh, we heard a lot during the campaign, if you remember the campaign uh, that President Clinton ran, uh, the uh, It's the Economy Stupid uh, campaign. Uh, and so a, a lot of Westerners uh, thought that, well, may, maybe he might be uh, reasonable on economic issues, but he, he tended not to be uh, as they affected Westerners and uh, Western states and particularly rural communities. And that's why on election night of 2000, you saw that sea of red uh, from essentially outside of St. Louis all the way over to the Cascades. The sea of red was the counties or were the counties that had voted for uh, President Bush and Vice President Cheney. Now, uh, let me give you some examples, and I'm going to write up here uh, because uh, I want to orient us as to where, where, where we are in the West, and, and I apologize to you uh, 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 people who uh, majored in geography and uh, know your maps. Uh, I've just met so many people that don't, uh, don't know uh, uh, geography very well. Uh, I had a law professor uh, at the University of Wyoming Law School named Larry Averill, and Larry had taught at uh, American University in Washington, D.C., and he came to Laramie, and I said, La Larry, what, what was the most interesting thing to you about coming to Laramie? And he said, well, I really was kind of disoriented. I said, well, how's that? He said, well, I didn't really know where Laramie was, but I knew it was close enough so that my wife and I could go shopping for weekends in San Francisco. Uh, and then not unless the law school's paying for jets, I guess. Uh, so uh, I was once in St. Louis. My late brother was, went to the Washington University in St. Louis, and I was there, and I ran into somebody in the cafeteria, and he found out my brother and I were from uh, Wyoming. And he said, where's Wyoming? And uh, I said, uh, you know Denver? Yeah, I know Denver. We go skiing there every, you know, we go to, we go to Vail every, every Christmas. And I said, well, you go to Denver and take a ride. It's Wyoming. So uh, let, me, let me start by talking about uh, some environmental issues that took place and some economic issues that took place in the West. This is my home state of Wyoming. I'm from there. Laramie's there. And, and this is Kane and Garfield County uh, down in southern Utah. Two of the poorest counties in all of Utah. And uh, the plan was that a, 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 a coal mine was going to be opened up there. The EIS, we've been talking about NEPA, the EIS was being prepared to study whether or not the federal government could allow uh, this development of a coal mine and whether or not it could be done consistent with protecting the environment and the quality of the human environment that these people uh, who live there happen to love. Uh, the estimate was that 1,000 people would have very high paying jobs in these underground mines, 1,000 people, and that there would be about a $17 million annual revenue stream uh, that would flow through this very economically uh, depressed region. And President Clinton, as you all know, in September of 1996, uh, went down here to Arizona and stood on the banks of the Grand Canyon, uh, the north rim of the Grand Canyon, and announced the creation of a 1.7 million acre national monument, a wilderness style national monument in the state of of Utah. Uh, I guess you don't have to ask, why didn't he go to Utah to do that? Uh, uh, he was being hung in effigy in, in Kanab. That's uh, probably why. Now, so, so he creates this, and the Washington Post says, gee, Mr. President, aren't you concerned about jobs? And he kind of bit his lower lip and, and you know, teared up a little. And he said, yeah, I'm kind of concerned about jobs, but we can't have mines everywhere. Well, pardon me for thinking that maybe we need to put them where the ore body is. Uh, but maybe that's just foolishness because uh, that was uh, the president's decision to, to close that area. So there go the jobs, uh, there goes the revenue stream, there goes that low sulfur coal that was going to be used to generate power to go to California and, and maybe solve some of California's energy problems that it had a couple of years ago. Let me mention another state, the state of Montana, I guess about like that, huh? and uh, Idaho, something like that. Uh, well, a little fat. Uh, not quite that big. Uh, 
We represent some people up in Lincoln County, Montana. Uh, Lincoln County, Montana, 78% of the county, 78% of the county is federally owned. It's part of the Kootenai National Forest. And as you might expect for an area like that, historically the jobs have been logging jobs and mining jobs. Well, over years, over the years, uh, lawsuits by environmental groups uh, and decisions by the Clinton administration over its years in office killed those jobs. And so the local community wanted to keep its kids there. It wanted to keep the hospitals open. It wanted to keep the schools going. Uh, and economy is how you do that. And so uh, they said, let's diversify. Let's, let's have some recreational activity up here. And so they began to develop a ski hill. They said, let's have a ski hill. That'd be cool. And people come from all around the world to Libby. <laughs> I have a friend from Libby. Uh, fourth generation logger named Bruce Vincent. And when he speaks to an audience, he always says, have you ever been to Libby? And <laughs> waits for the audience. And maybe one person raises a hand and he says, were you there on purpose? <laughs> and then he says, did you buy a major appliance on your way through? You know, tourism is our future. Um, you have visions of people going up there to buy uh, freezers. So, so they, they created a ski hill and they thought, well, this will help. We'll have jobs. We'll be able to diversify. And of course, it was going to be on national forest lands because after all, 78% of the county is uh, federally owned. Uh, and then the day President Clinton announced his roadless review policy, the Forest Service people called him in and said, your ski hill plan is dead. Uh, and that was the end of the jobs. Uh, that was the end of the diversification. And that was the end of that recreational activity in which they were uh, hoping to engage. In my home state of Wyoming, uh, this is uh, Sheridan County right here. Uh, Sheridan County. Uh, has uh, uh, right to the east is grasslands, uh, and here is the Bighorn National Forest. Uh, the largest private employer in Sheridan County is uh, uh, Wyoming Sawmills. And Wyoming Sawmills, as you might expect with grasslands over here, depends for timbering uh, in the Bighorn National Forest. It depends upon those uh, resources to develop timber, it, the community develop, uh, depends upon that activity to ensure forest health. And so it came as a great surprise and shock that 50,000 acres of this national forest that was scheduled to be harvested, was available for harvesting, had met all the environmental requirements for an area that ought to be harvested as the highest and best use of the land under the NEPA process, uh, was declared off limits because American Indians, some American Indians believe it's sacred and should be managed as a sacred site. And so in accordance with President Clinton's executive order uh, on the subject, uh, that closure was made. So there go the jobs, uh, uh, there goes that forest health activity, there goes the revenues uh, that depend. So you can see why on election night, all these folks said, uh, well, we think George Bush has a better plan. We think Dick Cheney has a better plan. We think uh, they understand. Professor Schroeder also talked about the difference on domestic issues, and here there really is a difference. And the difference is, uh, particularly here in the West where I'm from, and where we have many of our cases, and where we litigate uh, a lot of our cases, uh, there is a belief that one can balance environmental goals uh, with economic growth, that there can be a middle ground. And the, the unique position of the people there is they happen to live there, you see. And so you have people who live in Libby, Montana, uh, environmentalists who belong to environmental organization and you have bloggers and you have union workers and you have uh, county commissioners and other people who say we can work this out. We can work this out. We can have a compromise that allows us to harvest, uh, to protect our forests, to have jobs, to have the economy and, and yet to have the forests that we love and this uh, beautiful country that we enjoy going to. And one of the reasons why the the area turned red was because Governor George Bush said, and we already knew that about Dick Cheney, but Governor Bush said, I am a Westerner and I understand the Western mentality and this desire uh, that, that Westerners have uh, to be good stewards and to also have good jobs. Well, let me talk about some of the applications. I've talked generally about the economy, but let me talk generally about the application of environmental statutes. John Schuler is a uh, is a, uh, a sheep herder, and he lives up here in a place called Depoye, Montana. Depoy, I say Depoye, I don't know what they say up there. I'm afraid. Depoyer? Depoyer, there we go. Thank you, Montanans. Uh, and uh, 
So they say Du Poyer, and up in Du Poyer, John Schuller is a sheep herder, and one night he was attacked by a grizzly bear uh, while he was guarding his sheep, and he killed the grizzly bear in self-defense. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service brought an action against him, even though there is a uh, self-defense exception in the Endangered Species Act, uh, and said, we're not sure if he acted in self-defense. And I support that. That's a reasonable position to take. What are the facts of the case? So we went before an administrative law judge, and the administrative law judge found, as a matter of fact, that our clients was faced with fear of death or serious bodily injury. Well, as you know from criminal law, that's the standard. Uh, death or serious bodily injury, bingo, you get to defend yourself, as long as you don't escalate. But let's not go there. So, OK, after the ALJ says that, why doesn't the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service say, let's say it's over. We verify that we're cool. It doesn't. It continues to litigate against John next step was the Fish and Wildlife Service said, well, he went outside. When he went outside with his gun, he introduced himself into the zone of danger, thus robbing himself of his self-defense. Well, he appealed that and got thrown out. And then a higher authority said, well, uh, really the mistake he made was he took his dog with him, his dog Boone. This is classic. We're drinking water here from Tennessee. So he's got his dog Boone. And Boone goes on point. And when Boone goes on point, said the government provoked the bear. And so there goes the self-defense exception. And the judge threw that out. And finally, we get to a federal judge up here in Montana, and the, federal, and, and the government argues that bears deserve a higher standard for self-defense. In other words, when, when you kill a bear in self-defense, you've got to have a higher standard than just killing a human. That's after all, bears are incapable of sapient thought. Well, fortunately, uh, the judge uh, threw that out. And uh, the good news is, after eight years, we prevailed. Uh, and our client didn't have to pay that $5,000 fine. The bad news was, it cost Mountain State's Legal Foundation approximately $225,000 in attorney's fees to defend John Schuller. And so what does that say? What that says is there's no self-defense exception in the Endangered Species Act if the federal government's going to litigate against people like this every time they get a $5,000 fine. Heck, I'll pay the fine. Now let me tell you about another real-life consequence. Up in uh, Dubois, Wyoming, we say Dubois. We have a president of the University of Wyoming here in Laramie who says his name is Dubois. Now we tried to persuade him that he's Dubois. But he's not hearing this. I'm a big hockey fan. I was sad last night. My avalanche lost in overtime. Uh, if you follow hockey, you know the Colorado Avalanche had the greatest goaltender of all time, Patrick Waugh. Patrick Waugh. He came to Denver, and one of the reporters went up to Coach Crawford. He said, Coach Crawford, how long has Patrick Roy called himself Waugh? And the coach said, ever since he was a little boy. <laughs> So our hunter was from Evanston. <laughs> our hunter from Evanston went up to Dubois and went hunting, and all of a sudden, a terrible thing happened to him. He got unknown to him between a cub and mama. And mama came running. Mama grizzly bear came running. And John, uh, our client, uh, didn't become our client, a man named Van Fleet. Uh, Van Fleet was armed with a high powered rifle, and uh, he did an amazing thing. He laid his rifle down. And he took his pepper spray off his hip and waited for the bear. <laughs> I mean, it just boggles my mind. If you, there's a wonderful book about grizzly bears. But if you've got a weak stomach, I don't recommend it, but it's called Mark of the Grizzly. And it's probably over at the campus bookstore. And half the people, everybody in the book had a close encounter with a grizzly bear, and half are dead. So here's, our, here's Van Vliet waiting. And he hosed down the bear, and the bear came right through that pepper spray and, and grabbed him by the belt buckle. That, probably why we explain uh, where these big buckles and started flopping him around. But his friend was nearby and shot and killed uh, the bear. Uh, he was pretty messed up, five minutes. And uh, so I called him later and, uh, and uh, I asked him if, uh, why he'd laid the gun down. He said, Perry, I want to do the right thing. Uh, I was afraid I'd lose my hunting license. <laughs> I shot the bear. And, and I said, why? He said, because I've heard about your client, John Schiller, and I didn't want that to happen to me. I mean, that's a pretty incredible thing uh, when a person fears his government more than a grizzly bear. Now, I want to mention another guy down here, uh, uh, down here in uh, 
New Mexico, down here in Hobbs, New Mexico. Uh, this is a man who wanted to develop his property. He wanted to engage in activity. Uh, he had heard that the people over in the panhandle of Texas, I think it's something like that, isn't it? <laughs> I guess. Uh, but, but he had heard the people over in Midland were going to dispose of waters produced during oil and gas operations on his property, and he wanted to make sure that was a good thing. They were going to put water in these dry sinkholes, and he consulted an environmental expert because he says, Perry, I'm an environmentalist, and the environmental expert says, you got 300 feet of impermeable clay here. Uh, that's no problem. Uh, the EPA came in and sued him. This is making a very long 10-year story short. EPA sued him for... Uh, interfering with waters of the United States, the government's theory was the water would collect there and birds in interstate commerce would land in the, in the water. Uh, shut him down. Eventually, after 10 years, we collected $2 million uh, for just compensation and $225,000 in attorney's fees. And my point here is it was not about protecting the environment. Uh, there, there, there really wasn't environmental degradation there, but it was a real-life consequence of an application, a, I think a misapplication, improper application of the Endangered Species Act, not Endangered Species Act, but the Clean Water Act, and why this area turned, turned red on election night. Let me finally mention another case. Oh, you know what Colorado goes over like that, doesn't it? Who knew that? Anybody notice that? Oh, excellent. Okay, well, here's Nebraska like this. Yeah, I apologize for getting that wrong. I should know better. There, the North Platte River flows up out of Wyoming and then goes like that. Have I got that right? Yeah. Okay, that's the North Platte River. And there are mountain communities up here called Walden, Colorado and Saratoga, Wyoming. And the Fish and Wildlife Service said, we got species down here on the North Platte uh, that depend upon the water that is released. And so what we want under the Endangered Species Act is all these farmers and ranchers to give up their water. That's so we can produce more water for the for the fish, uh, the species. Well, the irony is here, the Forest Service has land here and here. And the Forest Service has this land, and the studies show that if the Forest Service would only manage this land to develop a little more timber, consistent with the Clean Water Act, so forth, it could generate all the water necessary. But the Forest Service says, no, we have, we have no legal obligation uh, to protect endangered species. That obligation belongs to the local people, the private people. They have to cough off. Cough cough up their, their water supply. And if you remember, the Endangered Species Act, when it was passed in 1976, the first order of battle, as we in the Marine Corps used to say, was that federal agencies were supposed to uh, protect species. So one of the problems that we have, and you'll understand this as you follow litigation by the Justice Department, the Justice Department has sort of a tunnel vision approach on this. And I, I mentioned that, tun that tunnel vision approach with regard to our guy John Schuler and the grizzly bear. And it's a win-at-all-cost mentality. I quote in my paper Justice Sutherland, who once said, government attorneys are supposed to strike hard blows, but never foul blows. And, and, and I mention in my paper uh, that one of my disappointments with the Bush administration is that in its litigation, it has not recognized uh, the limits of government concept that became so controversial uh, during the Clinton administration, the idea that uh, there are limits to the power of the president. Let me give you one example over in Oregon. And now I'm totally messed up, aren't I? But over here in Oregon, the president created a wilderness, uh, not a wilderness area, essentially a wilderness area, a national monument. And he created a national monument because Secretary Babbitt said, we want you to create this national monument, Mr. President, because we need it to protect endangered species habitat. Well, that may be a really reasonable goal. The, pro the problem is that the Endangered Species Act provides for how one protects critical habitat. You want to protect critical habitat? Have the Fish and Wildlife Service do it. Another example, of course, is the Hannaford Reach of the Columbia River. Another national monument created. This national monument created because Senator Murray was unsuccessful in having the river designated as a Federal Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, scenic, uh, River by the Congress. So she said, Mr. President, please designate it, and he did. And I think those were improper uh, applications. Earlier today, Professor Lesley said that there is environmentalists and then there was industry and nasty old Bush administration is lined up with the industry. Well, the only way you can make that sort of demarcation is if everybody who's not an environmental group is an industry group, an industry representative. And that is, that is certainly not the case. You have to ask yourself, why does local communities, 
who live and work and recreate in these areas? Why do local governments, why do state governments, why do congressional delegations here in the area where most of the federal lands are, where the rubber hits the road with regard to the environmental regulation, why do they support what President Bush and Vice President Cheney are doing? Uh, because they support that balance. They want their jobs. They want the environment protected. They want to keep their kids home. <coughs> They'd like their kids to come back and engage in those activities. Let me conclude uh, with one other forest example. We sued, of course, on behalf of these folks uh, when they lost their ski hill. Uh, we sued President Clinton uh, over the uh, over the roadless thing. We sued back in Washington, D.C. because we didn't want to go to the Ninth Circuit because it always gets reversed. Uh, and so we went to Washington, D.C. and we sued on that. And we sued in the year 2000 and then the terrible, terrible fires broke out. We've already heard about the terrible fires that broke out in Montana. Every state park, every state forest, every federal park, every federal forest was closed. Something else happened, too. We were in litigation. We were preparing affidavits. We were preparing declarations. We could not go to court. We asked the court to put a hiatus on our litigation for one reason. All our clients were fighting the fires. They were on the front lines of the battle. And this is really where, uh, where the impact is. My paper, as the professor has said, addresses my disappointment with the Bush administration uh, for not litigating, uh, I think, in a more proper manner and in a manner consistent with its representations uh, uh, during, uh, during the uh, uh, election. Uh, but I also believe that, uh, I believe that what the Bush administration is doing with regulations, the policies that it has taken outside the courtroom are consistent with what it said it was going to do and consistent with the desire of these people uh, who are really affected by environmental policy. Of course, we'll continue to debate this. Uh, one of my favorite stories from one of our cowboys out west is talking about people who are interested in something and people who are affected by something. Uh, and he gave this analogy. He said, the chicken is interested in what you're doing and what you're eating for breakfast. But the pig is affected. So, uh, if you get that. Uh, that's the, the story with uh, these folks. Uh, you all might be interested in this, and, and I love the fact that you are, and it shows what a great country that we have, that all of you are interested in what we're up to out there. Uh, but these folks out there are affected, and, and they really do care about that environment. They really are interested in protecting it because they live and they, and they work there. And for now, they believe the administration really wants to help them, and in the process, help their country. Thank you. Well, we have uh, just about 20 minutes for uh, discussion and comments and questions. And again, I invite the speakers from prior sessions also to engage in this, uh, in this conversation. Um, so if you have a comment or question, uh, I will uh, look for you and recognize you. Let me start by asking both of the speakers and, um, and John Leshy, if he's interested, to comment on this just as sort of factual, descriptive question of what position is the current Bush administration actually taking in court on, uh, on these cases? And of course, that may be heterogeneous across cases and statutes. But uh, as I read uh, Perry Penley's paper, his conclusion is the, on a host of very important legal issues, the litigating posture of this administration is no different than the last, and he cites several examples regarding the Utah uh, Grand Staircase Escalante Monument, the roadless rule, oil and gas mining, oil shale, et cetera, in which he expresses his disappointment that the Bush administration did not change from the Clinton administration. As I understood John Leshy earlier to say, express his disappointment that the Bush administration did change uh, from the Clinton administration. And even on the, on the NEPA cases that Lois Schiffer uh, described, at least the NEPA cases about the roadless rule seem to be cases in which the administration, by not litigating force clear, by not appealing, is acceding to the teeth of NEPA. That is, uh, the plaintiffs are arguing that an, the Forest Service did an inadequate uh, environmental impact statement. Um, so one could view those cases as victories for NEPA, even though they are 
um, uh, the Justice Department acceding to the claims of perhaps non-environmental plaintiffs. Um, but uh, so, so just on this descriptive question, how, can we get any handle on what the on what the administration is really doing? Well, let me give a few observations. First of all, um, you know, part of what the Justice Department does in defending agencies in court is taking the administrative record they get and applying the law to it. And administration in and administration out, there are sort of some general principles about. Uh, how you take an agency record and defend it that I think just sort of perk along and, and really uh, across the agent across the administrations there really isn't very much change in that and that's pr a big chunk of the cases it's not all of the cases and it's certainly not the most visible cases but it's a big chunk of the cases I would say so I think that you know it's a little of both when you say um, how can these perceptions be so different I mean there's some big body of cases that regardless of the administration they're just going to be uh, handled in the same way and are going to be defended. That's the first thing. Secondly, um, I don't think it's a victory for NEPA in the face of the extensive kind of EIS process that was undertaken on the roadless rule. To be sure, there were cases where in the Justice Department the agency record would come in and we would say to the agency, you know, well, I suppose we can defend you in this, but it's pretty much of a dead loser. And I'm not telling tales out of school, I don't think. You really might want to go back and consider doing an EIS instead of an EA or considering some more alternatives. And um, it, it, it really, you're just going to lose the case. I mean, you know, we can go to court, but it's pretty sure bet you're going to lose the case. I mean, there are no guarantees in litigation, but you will lose the case. Um, so there were those, um, uh, there, there, every, and every, it, Tim, I also was in the Reagan administration. To my knowledge, that happens in every administration. That's just sort of a lawyer's realistic assessment of let me look at the law, let me look at the facts. I'm going to give you my best prediction of what's going to happen. And that's, you know, happens. That is very different from taking what is an extremely substantial record, plainly a highly defensible case, it won in the Ninth Circuit, it's hard to argue that it isn't a highly defensible case, and say we're not going to defend it, which in effect is what happened here. And I don't think that's a victory for NEPA. I think that is something that really says um, that, that this is a statute we see as an obstacle instead of something that provides useful information, and we think that this process works and we're going to go ahead and defend it. So to me, that's not a victory. I think in the more general question, um, part of it is that the Justice Department, uh, that the Justice Department gets in court on mostly, not totally, on behalf of other agencies. And so a lot of what happens is the underlying agencies make new decisions or make different kinds of decisions, and then they're going to get defended. And a piece of, I think, where um, uh, Mr. Penley and I may differ is that I think some of what's happening is the agencies are changing. But I also understand from people inside the Justice Department that the, the ju on some kinds of cases, the Justice Department is being tougher with the agencies about uh, an expansive conduct, the concept of uh, what is foreign policy, a somewhat expansive concept of what should be left to the president, and a somewhat expansive concept of where courts just shouldn't have any role at all. And I do think that is somewhat different. Mr. Penley, do you want to comment on well, this? Well, I, I just wouldn't cite to the Ninth Circuit as, uh, as a good example for uh, why a statute is, uh, or an activity is proper uh, that the Ninth Circuit agreed. The uh, uh, Ninth Circuit's uh, the most, uh, the circuit on which uh, cert is most frequently granted and the circuit that's most frequently overturned. So uh, I wouldn't rely on the Ninth. You, uh, let me just say one thing about that. No, because there are any number of cases, I can't cite you one at the moment, where two circuits make the same decision, and then if the Supreme Court takes the Ninth Circuit case and then reverses it, it's actually also reversing the decision by the other circuit as well. Um, and also, most cases are taken to reverse, and so the fact that a circuit has a high reversal rate is not, I mean, you, that's probably true of most circuits. So, so I think that's somewhat misleading. The Ninth Circuit runs the full spectrum of judges from the most uh, conservative, the most disliking of the government to the most, you know, con uh, not conservative, and I think it's a it's a, if you take a look at the decision, instead of just shooting the messenger of the Ninth Circuit, it's a very uh, pretty carefully detailed decision. Now, John Leshy, I see you're back benching, but I'll, so I'll let you pass if you're not interested here. But if you'd like to comment, I'd sure. love to hear your comment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, no, just a couple of quick, a couple of quick examples. I think, uh, not to be too cynical, well, I will be cynical. Uh, I think this administration uh, makes the calls on the legal cases on the premise of what they can get away with. Let me give you a couple of concrete examples. I think they would have loved to not defend the National Monument, the Clinton National Monument, uh, 
uh, early on in the administration, they announced quite proudly that they were going to look at re-examining them and possibly abolishing them and all that sort of thing. And they tried to open them up to oil and gas leasing. And Congress stopped them. And I think they went out and took soundings and discovered that the National Mine and Flint Bid were actually very popular. And they thought it was really a bad idea to reverse legal positions on that. Plus the fact that there's been a whole bunch of cases litigating national monuments over the last uh, 97 years. And they've all, every single one of them, has said, of course, the president has the power to do this. So there's really no credible legal case to overturn it anyway. Um, the, on the other hand, the, the example I cited this morning, this Endangered Species Act reversal on the issue of whether the federal water contract uh, immunized the contractors from losing water to endangered species. That is an incredibly subtle, below the radar screen issue. Uh, they have taken a position in the district court in New Mexico and in the Court of Appeals in the Tenth Circuit that is directly contrary to uh, about five cases in the Ninth Circuit on this exact point. Uh, that was litigated in the Reagan administration and the first Bush administration as well as the Clinton administration. So here is, is one they, I think, they thought they could get away with, and they may well get away with it. A, a substantial reversal that nobody's ever heard about in the federal court. Let me, let me uh, uh, add, uh, make a comment on that if I could. Uh, there is a credible legal case to be made, and, and those of you who have studied natural resource law and public lands law, uh, you'll understand what I'm talking about here. Uh, the history of uh, public lands law and federal lands law was essentially uh, uh, beginning in the early 1900s with President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt's uh, uh, activities, his uh, what, muscular presidency, in which he began to take activity with action with regard to federal lands. For decades, Congress acquiesced in the president's uh, usurpation of, uh, of the congressional power. As you know, the property clause said Congress shall make all needful rules and regulation, regulations respecting uh, the territories and property of the United States. Now, this is the property clause, and it is under the express and control and sole control of Congress. So the president may do only what Congress says he may do, or she may do. Uh, but in, through the early part of this, uh, the, the last century, uh, Congress looked the other way as the president engaged in these activities. In 1970, a bipartisan panel called the Public Land Law Review Commission looked at the issue and said, you know, Congress needs to reassert its authority. And Congress did in 1976 in the Federal Land Policy and Management Act. Now, one of, the, of course, Cong one of the things Congress left standing was the Antiquities Act of 1906. When the Antiquities Act of 1906 was adopted, uh, Interior said, make it broad. Give us the power to protect beautiful places and scenic places. And Congress said, no, we're going to keep it narrow. This is just for items of antiquity. And granted, uh, for those decades, the presidents used uh, both stripes, both political stripes, used the Antiquities Act to lock up uh, vast areas of land. But no Supreme Court case has been issued post-1976 to say to us, what did Congress mean when in 1976 it reasserted its authority yet left standing the Antiquities Act? Isn't it reasonable uh, that in doing so, uh, Congress sought to limit the Antiquities Act to its original, uh, its original view as opposed to this very broad Theodore Roosevelt type approach. Uh, and that's why there is a credible case to be made today with regard to it. Furthermore, do these other environmental statutes have meaning? I mean, the, the federal government, the Clinton administration and the Bush administration argued in court that essentially the Act, Antiquities Act is a catch-all environmental statute. It can be used to protect endangered species, to protect wetlands, to protect wild and scenic rivers, for any, any environmental goal uh, that the president deems proper. As, as lawyers, does that make any sense to us that Congress passed a law? I mean, what's the meaning of the Endangered Species Act if the Enda Endangered Species Act really is assumed up in, in, in the Antiquities Act in a very broad interpretation? So I think there's a very credible case to be made. I don't know if the Escalante Grand Staircase uh, decision once we get out of the district court and get through the Tenth Circuit, we'll be heard by the Supreme Court. But there's a very credible case to be made uh, on what, what many of us believe to be the overreach by uh, President Clinton on his use of monuments. Okay, very quick follow-up by Lois, and then I want to make sure people, other people have a chance to One second. Those questions. Um, the, the establishment of um, the Grand Canyon and or Yellowstone was challenged in court. I can't remember which. Grand Canyon, and it was upheld as a, as a perfectly appropriate monument under the Antiquities Act as an object of interest. Pre-Flipma. Uh, Pre-Flipma. Post-Flipma, 
Mr. Penley brought some cases challenging these monuments that were um, decided against him by the D.C. Circuit. That is a post flip because that was 2002 or so. So um, the, the Antiquities Act is there. The general pattern, and John gives, bless you, gives a great speech on this, is when some of these monuments get established, they aren't perfectly popular. The CNO Canal in my own backyard is a perfect example. When it was established, nobody liked it. Now, you know, every congressman and senator hikes on it. I mean, it's an incredibly popular place. So it, it's, um, uh, I, I think, to say that there hasn't been a court decision is just wrong. There may not have been a Supreme Court decision post Flitma, but there have been other court decisions, and they've all upheld the actions of the Clinton administration. And, okay. the, and, and the D.C. <laughs> Circuit opinion on our Six Monument case was not on the, uh, not on our uh, specific, on the challenge. It was on the on the procedural issue about the adequacy of the complaint. Okay, let's... Um, invite uh, additional points here. Sir. I have more of a comment than anything. I think something we're missing here, I know it's added resources, but the administration has done a great job of allowing DOJ to back off its resources, view enforcement cases under the Clinton administration, which is going to free up or excuse 50 power plants from it. Well, I signed those complaints, so I'm particularly painfully aware of them. Right. <laughs> uh, right. You'll get okay. the pollution down here. Thank you. Um, Chris Schrader? Uh, I just want to agree with uh, Mr. Penley that there is a big difference uh, on economic issues in the way he was describing between the Clinton administration and the Bush administration. I never said anything to the contrary. I said both any administration would be concerned about economic growth. But clearly, a Democratic administration, you'd be seeing growth in different areas than Mr. Penley wants in the West. Um, and it's no surprise, I think, that if you just if you ask local people what they want to do with the national land in their immediate area, they're going to come up with a different balance than if you ask the question at a national level. That, that simple externalities analysis from economics, we're all familiar with it. Now, the fact of the matter is the lands are national public lands. And it just can't be the right answer as to how you use national public land that you say it's whatever the local people want uh, in using them. I credit a lot of Westerners with being very conservation-minded. They're still going to draw a different balance in trying to figure out how to use local land than will be drawn at a national level, because there are interests beyond the local county, the state, even the region, that may or have an interest in particular uses of those lands. They are the nation's lands. They're not Utah's lands or Nevada's lands or Reno's lands. And it's legitimate for a national administration to take those interests into account. And certainly you can, you can criticize specific actions that are taken in the name of conservation or the environment as being too harsh or too indifferent to the economic interests that are on the other side. But that's quite a different argument than simply pointing out, pointing out that the locals were opposed, and therefore, it's a bad national policy to follow. The difficult question in these areas is, is how do you do the analysis? And I don't think the answer is you defer to the local. <laughs> you do the analysis, and you take into account national level interests. And it, these are big questions in the West, and it is one reason those are all red states. <laughs> now, it's one third of the nation's land. The Western 11 states, it's 50% of those lands. You, Nevada, it's 80%. Right. Alaska, it's two thirds. It's no, there's no reason to doubt that these are big questions. The Vice President Gore's stand on the environment probably cost him the election because he didn't take West Virginia as a result of his uh, opposition to uh, relaxing coal mining rules in West Virginia. So these are big level questions. There is a big difference between the two points of view. And it just can't be the right answer that, that each time a local group or county supervisor stands up and says, this will be bad for my economy, that that's the end of the discussion. And I want to just say one more thing, completely unrelated. <laughs> but I never said either that 
military policy would be the same under both Democratic and Republican administrations. I said they'd both be equally concerned with national security. In point of fact, national security would be a lot better off <laughs> if we were not under the Bush administration. <laughs> <laughs> international scored after September 11th by our reckless unilateralism, and we would have understood the sophistication with which you have to deal with that problem. So, end of remark. <laughs> Uh, let, me, okay, let, like, uh, let me comment on, you well, know, not all this. I, I want to, uh, yeah, no, no, I want to I wanna give you a chance to comment. I also want to try to get in one or two other uh, audience comments before we need to break. So please go ahead. Well, I, I'll keep it brief. You're right. It was off the point. But on, on the issue of federal lands, it's not just federal lands that are affected. There's private lands affected as well. When, when the, uh, when the uh, Clinton administration decided to bring wolves into Yellowstone, uh, the recognition was, was, was that the wolves would not stay in Yellowstone, uh, that they would spread throughout the region. Now, there's a lot of federal lands out there, but even in Wyoming, only 50% of the lands are federal lands. And there was a recognition that these wolves would go onto private property and they would live on the private property. Now, what, uh, now are, are there are abundance of wolves in, uh, in Canada. There are abundance of wolves in Alaska. Thank goodness they'll never lose wolves. They'll always be on this planet. But the question is uh, that, yes, they used to be in Wyoming. They used to be in Montana. Idaho. Should we put them back in? Well, let me ask another question. They used to be in Rock Creek Park in Washington, D.C., too. Uh, why don't we put them there? And, and, and the reason is the judges and uh, congressmen and the people like to walk up and down uh, the CNO Canal uh, don't want their poodles eaten by, uh, uh, by wolves. Uh, and you say, well, why not? And, and the thing is, the conclusion is, the conclusion is that the ranchers in Wyoming aren't really very important, and there aren't very many of them, but a lot of people live in Washington and, and hike on the CNO Canal, and, and that's why we're going to do this. And I think that's, that's a bankrupt policy. It's a bankrupt policy to say the people out west, there are not many of them, and they aren't very important, and they only have three electoral votes in Wyoming, so let's do it. Uh, I, think we better, I think we ought to have a little better uh, rationale uh, than that. Uh, um, since, since you brought up the wolves, I mean, and, and you've talked a lot about the economic benefit to these people of, of extracting resources, um, are you aware that introducing wolves to Yellowstone has, has um, been a boon to the regional economy in, in the amount of roughly $20 million compared to 100 or so livestock losses per year? Um, and, and so, is that necessarily a bad thing for the local people? And even if it is uh, maybe more part of the national agenda than, than the, the local livestock interests. Well, I, I listened to the supervisor's comments earlier, and she's talking about the statistics on how the economic benefit really, there is a really economic benefit uh, to, to roadless things. There really is an economic benefit, she didn't say it, but you're saying it, uh, to having wolves there, uh, and which you sort of say, well, gee, if there's such an economic benefit, why do the locals oppose it? And the implication is they're stupid. Uh, gee, if they really knew what was good for them, they'd do this thing. They'd want to do this thing. And I don't think they're stupid. Uh, so I, I, I doubt the numbers. Um, we, you got to sell an awful lot of T-shirts and snow cones uh, during the tourist season uh, to make up for losses of some logging, logging jobs and the closure of some mills. And that's what, we're, well, that's what we're being told. We're being told, well, it, it's okay that you're losing this mill, but you'll have this, uh, you'll have this recreational activity that during the summer you'll bring a lot of tourists in. Um, that's why my friend jokes about buying big appliances. Uh, <clears throat> one, one other possibility is that there are different constituencies who lose and who benefit from the two different sets of economic effects. Uh, and, and another possible... Um, uh, example or setting for this debate that, that we've been having, very interesting debate over national versus local control, would be uh, national monuments in Washington, D.C., where the locals have no representation in Congress. Uh, and I wonder if that's ever been a sticking point. Lois says maybe the CNO Well, I, I, of but, course, live in Washington, right, D.C., so uh, I don't have senators and congressmen. And my favorite story is once I said that to someone and they said, you're wrong. <laughs> but I don't have senators and congressmen, and I vote every okay. time I get a chance. So we, we will um, uh, continue this conversation with uh, any and all who can attend. I want to 
thank our speakers uh, very much for very stimulating.